everybody for being with us. Okay, <laughs> definitely. Hold on, there's still more people coming. Hold on a second. Okay, um, my, my name is Ben Skolnick, and with Altai Kaskun, I'm the co-host of this series, the Seleucid Lecture Series, which has been going on for what, two, two years now? Uh, two and a half years now. And uh, so today we're going to try something different. Uh, what we've had in the past is a lecturer and a and a and a respondent and then a discussion. But we wanted to try something different. There are certain topics in the field of Hellenistic history um, and culture that keep coming up that are well attended to in terms of you know people writing great papers about them. And so we thought we'd have a discussion about Daphne, about the procession. Um, and we have four participants today, all of whom have written well and brilliantly, if you ask me, on this subject. Um, and I just want to um, just to throw out a few questions. And if the respondents talk about these questions or not, it doesn't matter. But I just uh, sort of a few things that I think are, uh, are of interest. First of all, what was this thing? Um, uh, Altai and something sent out called it a parade, a procession, an event, um, a religious festival. So, you know, what was it? Um, and uh, one of the things that we'll be talking about, I'm sure, is the date, because chronology always affects everything. If the date that Nick Secunda has proposed is accepted, it throws out a lot of the old theories about what this was. If it was seen as a victory celebration after coming back from Egypt, um, uh, sort of in the face of the day of Eleusis or something like that, well, if Nick's date is accepted of, I think it's August 166, if I remember correctly, that throws that out. Um, is it um, an opening uh, gambit before going on the Anabasis to, well, to the Egypt? Exam so, is oh, okay, Stone is here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and um, so, you know, what was it? Was it for internal consumption or external consumption or both? Um, uh, Pierre-Luc Brisson, who couldn't be with us today because of a conference uh, in Canada, has a wonderful paper on the subject. And he talks mm -hmm. about, if you'll pardon my French, di uh, diplomatic di di dialogue, uh, that it's it's a, an event in a diplomatic dialogue um, so is, is it that? And if it was uh, an event for external consumption, to whom? The Greek states, to Rome, to the Ptolemies? Um, you know, what was it? Was it a response to uh, uh, other festivals that Antiochus had um, envied because he heard about them? Uh, was it a display of military force? And if so, when, with all the details about the military force, what can we learn about the composition of Antiochus IV's military, and what 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 do we learn about the might of that army? Um, what what can we learn from its religious dimension? Um, how do we read our sources? And just the last question is: What was the effect of this whole thing? Um, did did it have an effect? So those are just some of the questions I'm sure we'll be coming around to. So we're going to call first on Rolf Strutman, uh, who probably needs no introduction for anybody, who's at the University of Utrecht, Utrecht who I uh, is the chairman of the uh, ancient history department and who has written, well, if I remember a couple of things, I remember already in your doctoral thesis, you'd written about this procession, if I'm not mistaken. And then that wonderful article in the Brussels volume. That's just among things that I know. So Rolf, please, it, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much um, also for this uh, organizing this, this event. Um, as always, I will now have to try and get my PowerPoint on. You're doing well. And I you can see it. it. Yeah. And now it's full screen, right? Yes, now it is. Am I, am I good to go? You're well, good thanks. To go. Very good. <laughs> we have to keep this, uh, I have to keep it short. So I created a lot of text slides, which I would be happy to share later on so that you can read it at your leisure, um, so that I can be brief or try to be brief at this moment. Um, what I wanted to do is, um, all I can do is is to perhaps open up some discussion by summarizing what I have, what, what my own thoughts have been about the Daphne Festival um, from indeed my doctoral dissertation uh, when I first started to think about it 
um, until uh, the future, um, uh, a forthcoming article on the religious dimensions of uh, of the festival that is due, I think, in 2025. At the end of my PowerPoint, there is a, a, a bibliography of the, uh, the works that I consulted, um, uh, all, all, all written by myself, I'm afraid. <laughs> and uh, I will at this moment do uh, the following, discuss the following things. First of all, when I first started to think about the Daphne Festival, um, I think that it should be more looked at, um, or at least I think that was, was something that has not been done in the past enough, from its religious perspective. It is a festival. So this is why I put that point first. And uh, one of the things that I started to think about then, and that I will repeat now, is that I think that it was a New Year celebration for reasons that I will show you. Then the next thing that I will say something about is our, its political, its social political dimensions. And then, of course, you can also read the Polybius uh, and Diodorus text um, uh, from an ideological perspective. Um, and as you can see, uh, that's not what I find at this moment the most important. Um, and a lot of people have been saying uh, uh, very good things about it. So let's quickly start. The festival's religious nature. This is an image of, uh, of Daphne, uh, of course, as it looks before uh, the great earthquake um, where, of which the, the epicenter was near Daphne. Uh, and then the second earthquake uh, had as its epicenter Daphne. Precisely this place. So I have no idea what it looks like now. I have only one slide in this chapter, and that is the argument that the Daphne Festival can be seen as a New Year festival, and there are several reasons for that. Um, I don't think it's good to 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 stay too long at at this text, um, but I've recognized I have the idea that there is some ritual, um, some ritual conversion taking place. Um, a kind of ritualized enemy and other aspects that are reminiscent of New Year festivals, not only in the Near East, uh, also a little bit in, in, in Greece. And of course, the festival that one thinks of immediately is Akitu in Babylon. However, I do not think that this is derived from Akitu, um, for it can be shown, and others have done that, that from the, the early first millennium BCE, Akitu-like festivals were current all over the Near East, so also in Syria and the Levant. So I think this is a pre-Hellenistic Near Eastern festival that was Hellenized or Macedonianized in some sense. The presence of all the gods who go to Daphne to celebrate, I guess, that's what they do. That's not what Polybius says. He only says that all the gods and demi gods were there, is also reminiscent of, uh, of, of Babylonian Akitu and these other festivals of which we have less information. We know, however, that they were there. Uh, and I also, but I don't really have that, 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 that route, and I think Nick is the person who can say more about it, um, that it must be at some kind of, at some um, a new Year moment uh, in the year. Um, uh, the last most controversial aspect, I think, of what I argue there is that the king may be impersonating Dionysus, the, uh, the, the, the royal god par excellence. Um, and Dionysus, of course, if this is true, is also a New Year god. Second, I will say something more about... Um, 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 how I see its social political functions, and that has all to do with the way that the court functions. A court travels, and during it travels, a lot of people will go to the court, but also the, co the court will try to attend certain uh, uh, grand festivals, and specifically religious festivals, that people will go to anywhere. So the court is both trying to reach out, is going to places where they can meet people, powerful people, um, but also uh, um, trying to create events that attract people. Um, and this is more or less how, how you can imagine that uh, how this, this, this happens. Uh, the imperial elite participates in a cult, can be a local cult, can indeed be Akitu in, in Babylon, can be a festival in a Greek city. And then local elites 
will also participate and then the cult, the sanctuary becomes a kind of common ground or neutral contact zone where the empire um, and, and, and local powers can meet. So the meeting of, uh, well, of the global and the local. But this is a big festival, of course. Another very simplistic <laughs> diagram showing what I mean. Um, the court is small, otherwise it can't travel. But for a specific festival or perhaps a coronation, things like that, elites will go to the court and you will create uh, what court historians call an outer court. So the court expands and this can happen in a religious setting, can even happen in a sanctuary. And this is where people meet and where negotiations take place uh, as I see empire as a transactional uh, negotiated enterprise and furthermore as a network system. Concerning the text, this is the text, of course, we don't have very much, but this is one of the things that everybody always cites, uh, in which it said that Antiochus sent out envoys and sacred embassies to the cities, I think, must be there, to the cities, to uh, announce the game, meaning that these games are announced well in advance, to give the cities, at least, that who are mentioned here, time to go to the fest to festival, to send out uh, sacred embassies. Um, and, uh, and well, there is, there's a lot of... Well, this shows, to my mind, that the festival is meant to attract the representatives of uh, local autonomous cities. The context that Polybus gives is, 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 of course, the Aegean. So I think the Aegean is very important here. A festival like this can have been repeated, is something that, that Altai has, has suggested. Um, so I don't think it's really aimed at, at, at the east, not at Iran, uh, perhaps not even at Babylonia, but more this is very close to the coast at the, the uh, well, well at, at the eastern Mediterranean and at the Aegean, because this could have been repeated elsewhere, only we don't have any information about that because of Polybius's Western bias. I promise to keep this brief. So we are already in chapter three here. The festival's ideological messages. So first we, um, uh, there, 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 there is a festival. The, the dynasty expands that festival, makes it into a kind of a dynastic festival. And then because of the festival, uh, it, it, well, it aims at it specifically organized to attract representatives of local power holders or local power holders themselves. And then, of course, there is the, uh, the festival's ideological messages, specifically seen in what I prefer to call a procession rather than a parade. Um, I don't really, uh, I do have a problem with the idea that in the Hellenistic age, a religion declined and that festivals, and this is what we read in the older literature, festivals became political. Of course, it's political, but we are also here in the ancient world, so you cannot uh, separate religion and politics from each other. Here again, uh, what Diodorus writes, namely that Antiochus Epiphanes put his entire mon monarchy upon a stage. That's also an important thing. Um, at least have, we, 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 we have to do something with these, with these sources. So the, the, the festival is meant to project an image of the Seleucid Empire to those who uh, were the onlookers, but we also have the possibility, of course, of uh, word of mouth uh, um, um, information going around by people who attended the festival. And there is, of course, the possibility, no evidence at all, but we have evidence that this happened in Ptolemaic Egypt with these, the grand procession of Ptolemy II, um, that, that written accounts of processions like these were created and circulated around the Mediterranean. And these are the final, the uh, the the, well, the 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 main points that you could also kind of simplistic read into what happens there. Um, so I won't say anything really about the date, uh, and agree with uh, with with Nick's uh, uh, dating of the festival, uh, at least the year. And I won't say anything about the army um, at this point, but this is like the messages that the um, the, the uh, festival conveys. Namely, that um, the festival, the participation of the dynasty in the festival, 
associates the dynasty with an important religious festival in an important regional sanctuary. The Seleucids did that too, of course, in Babylon. What happens also emphasizes various aspects of monarchy, of Near Eastern slash Hellenistic monarchy. It emphasizes the king's role as the creator of peace and the bringer of good fortune. This is where one can uh, start to suspect that Dionysus may indeed be a model here. Uh, but this is, of course, a very generic thing that kings do. It shows, of course, the military strength of the empire. And I think specifically, as at least Polybius says, that the, the audience is civic, are uh, urban elites. There cannot be more people, of course, but that they are urban elites from the Aegean who must at least have been there. Um, one of the important messengers must have been the king's ability to protect cities because that's what king, kings do, uh, protecting uh, cities. Hellenistic kings, of course, basically are gangsters collecting protection money. It presents the empire as a field Völkerstaat, showing different peoples in the procession, but of course, uh, as, as Harrison argued, um, they mostly come from the periphery, so it's, it's a problem, it's not really comparable to what the, 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 the Achaemenids did, did with their uh, military parades, if we use that word, for convenience. And it shows, and I think that's unintentional, um, because I think that would be obvious to, to anyone uh, at this period, that the Treaty of Apamea does not pertain to Antiochus IV, because his father had sworn that treaty, so only his father should uh, abide by that. And in some, and this is something that I wrote in the, um, in the Brussels volume, um, it underlines the Seleucid Empire's return as a major superpower, notably in the Aegean, equal to Rome. At this moment, nobody uh, except Polybius perhaps knew what the future had in store and that Rome would eventually be the only superpower. At this moment, um, the, um, the Roman Empire is not yet the single superpower in the Mediterranean, or at least uh, not to most people living in the uh, Near East. Uh, and yes, um, this is this is debated, but I do think that um, the Aegean is uh, uh, at least one of the main uh, provides one of the main audiences for what happens there. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we have lots of questions, but our format is to go to the next speaker. I know I, I have will. about five or six questions already, but I'll have to remember them. Um, so our next speaker, if you could get off of your shared screen, Rolf. Uh, great, thank you. Um, will be Stephen Harrison, who is a lecturer at, in ancient history at the University of Swansea and who wrote a beautiful article, which I think was in Seleucid Perspectives 1, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, so we're calling on Stephen. Really, thank you, Ben, and, and thanks everyone for, uh, well, thanks to Ben and, and Alte for, for inviting me, and also I think for kind of, I was excited about the format of this. I think it's nice to get different voices talking about an issue like this, and, and hopefully lots of, of valuable things will come out of this. I was sort of frantically rewriting what I was going to say just as, as Rolf was speaking, because I don't want to repeat what he said, basically. Um, so in, in, I guess, headline terms, the way that I've used Daphne, in the work that Ben was alluding to is really as a way of thinking about Seleucid conceptualizations and representations of empire and by extension society. And I guess that reflects my interest in Seleucid ideology and the construction of imperial ideology more broadly. Rather than kind of talk about any of my specific theories in detail, um, what I wanted to do today was draw out three or four reasons why I think Daphne is worth talking about and why I think it's an interesting example to meditate on from a methodological standpoint and how we might use Daphne to play into broader discussions of the Seleucid Empire. Um, the first point that I'd make is to do with how Daphne plays into discussions of ideology. And as somebody who writes about ideology, often we're dealing with abstract things which are only loosely grounded in space and time and where 
you aren't sure about the audience or, or things like that. And I think the first reason that I find Daphne interesting is because although we can debate the precise date, we can at least fix it roughly in time and and rough and and you know very clearly in in space. There's obviously questions then that that come out of that about how typical can one moment be of broader ideological constructions, and that fits in methodologically with things like what do we do with the Antiochus cylinder from Borsippa? Is that something that's grounded explicitly in local identity? Is it something that is a unique artifact? Is it something that might be replicated elsewhere? And all of those kinds of questions. For me, there's a question in the kind of Daphne procession, which is to do with the composition of the troops that are, are mentioned there. Is this something that is affected just by who's around on site and reasons of practicality? If we were to have a similar moment in the east of the empire, would the troop compositions be different? And how might that affect the way that we, we read that? And so I think it Daphne there is opening up a question of how do we use one specific moment as a, a lens into something much broader? And one of my ways of kind of answering that question or responding to that question is to try to see Daphne in a bit more of a comparative perspective. Um, there's obviously been lots of work done on Hellenistic processions in terms of seeing Daphne alongside the obvious example be, being kind of the grand procession of, of Ptolemy Philadelphus and kind of trying to see this as a way to think about the Seleucid Empire in comparison with the Ptolemaic Empire. Other people have looked at, at Roman examples. The obvious example is Aemilius Paulus and Amphipolis, only just before the procession of Daphne. But people have sought connections to, to, Ro uh, to Roman triumphs and things. And I think that that comparative perspective, when you have a kind of event that is um, common across lots of imperial societies, it's a way of teasing out things that are inherent or commonplace among the construction of imperial identity and also, and I think importantly, identifying elements that are interesting, unique and specifically Seleucid. So in my work, I've done that by comparison with the Cayman of Precedence, particularly Xerxes at Sardis. But I think there's also scope to use Daphne as a way to bring Seleucid's, Seleucid scholarship into dialogue with, for example, medieval work early modern ex, you know, constructions of kingship and identity. Um, one of the reasons I think that recognising the potential for comparative work is important is because I think when we see the range of societies in which this kind of thing happens, it helps us to recognise that what happened to Daphne actually is probably much more common than we think within the Seleucid Empire or much more common than we perhaps acknowledge. And I wonder if actually sometimes we attach too much importance to Daphne and see it as being too much of a unique event, precisely because it's the only example that we have that, that kind of survives. I wonder if, you know, Rolf was talking about it being a New Year's festival, perhaps, which might mean this is something that's happening regularly. If this is something that's happening regularly, that opens up an interesting question about should we actually be trying to see it as a victory celebration or a grand depart for an Eastern Alabasis? Or actually... Is this a, a one-off occasion or maybe a regular occasion that's given kind of a specific colouring by contemporary events? So I think that's another area where we can kind of try to think about how this one surviving example fits into broader imperial display and imperial practices. The other area I think that's really important here is that obviously the reports, and Rolf brought up a couple of them, the reports of this come from external sources and it opens up an important methodological question about how we interpret the surviving evidence and how we balance external reporting of the Seleucids with internal evidence there's obviously clear parallels there with discussions that have happened in studies of the Achaemenids um, and I think well actually Rolf gave a good example of it in terms of trying to tease out some of the religious implications perhaps of the procession is that there's potential here for us to read between the lines to try to think about alternative perspectives on on Daphne and to remember that we have this one report or a handful of but two reports that come from the same external perspective and that perspective of other people including and this is perhaps really key including people who participated in the procession themselves and would have been mouthpieces who took their perspective back to their own communities on this parade um, those perspectives have been lost and might have been, been very different. 
And then my final point, and I think it kind of ties into everything that I've said, is a question of what Daphne means for Seleucid historiography. I think if we think in broad brush terms about how people have discussed or thought about the Seleucids over the last 125 years or so, there are probably two key themes that stand out in scholarly debate for me. The first is the question of whether the empire was strong or weak. And the second is whether it was Eastern facing or Western facing. And we all know the kind of key pivotal turning points in, in those debates. Um, and I think that that, you know, with Daphne, there's an obvious question here of, well, this is a reassertion of Seleucid imperial might after Apamea and in the face of the challenges that the Seleucids are facing. This is a demonstration that the Seleucids were were strong and still strong. But actually, if this is a regular festival, are we right to be making that kind of jump? And I think it plays into a problem I have with the way we frame Seleucid scholarship in those terms, which is that that debate for me is entirely artificial really and actually when Kurt and Sherman White were pushing back against the Seleucids being a weak empire that's a framework that derives from Bevan writing in 1902 and that's a framework that's drawn out of the Victorian era that's implicitly grounded in Victorian attitudes towards the Ottoman Empire and I think there's a real danger in those kind of frameworks that actually we're kind of still talking about a outdated kind of big picture view of how to talk about the Seleucids. And I think maybe there's opportunities here to change that perspective and find alternative big frameworks for, for thinking about for thinking about the Seleucids where we're not yeah artificially tying tying all of this back to a debate that I think is really problematic and is in many senses reflective of Orientalist discourse in the 19th and early 20th century. Um yeah, so I think those were the kind of big places that I wanted to get to. And I think just Daphne, maybe with putting it into a comparative perspective, thinking about some of those methodological issues might help us find different avenues that we can go down, not just for the study of this particular incident, but as a way to move Seleucid discourse along more generally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. By the way, thank you speakers for really being contained, because I know that each of you could speak for an hour at a clip. But thank you, Stephen. And again, I've got questions. I'd love to push back, but we'll we'll have to wait. Um, so we're calling now on Nick Secunda, who needs no introduction, but we'll do one anyway. Um, he is maybe, for me, like the master of ancient military history or Hellenistic history. Um, he's at the University of Gdansk. And I want to mention that he was just honored with a feshrift um, and a, a collection of a, a lot of articles from colleagues all around the world which is a wonderful honor for him. And um, I got a chance to review it and it was a real pleasure. Um, so, and Nick has already been referenced a few times in this discussion because even though I had to find it in Appendix D of, of, uh, of a volume he had, um, he's written a really very prominent article um, uh, that everybody's referenced about the date. And I think he's sort of the man now besides everything else on the date of Dante. So Nick, please. Uh, well, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Ben. I'll I'll just talk about the date as I see it. Yeah, and uh, uh, well, the Emperor Julian, writing in the fourth century AD, when speaking of Apollo at Daphne, tells us that in the tenth month, the tenth month, according to your reckoning, Laos, I think you call it, there is a festival, Aorto founded by your forefathers in honour of this god. Uh, and it was your duty to be zealous in visiting Daphne. And, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the nature of the, of the festival may have changed over time, but I think that, uh, that uh, it will be located in the month of Laos, which is about August. Um, uh, and uh, this is supported by, I've, I've just, uh, I, I'm not really prepared for this, I've just uh, re re reread re re the, uh, the parts of my book, which uh, sort of opportune to, uh, uh, opportune to this, but this, this ties in with, uh, with, uh, um, um, in one, 159, Hannibal, meets Antiochus, the son of Antiochus III at Daphne. 
where he was holding a ritual games. And uh, Hannibal had left Carthage, or rather sailed from the island of uh, Turkina, yeah? um, which hollow interprets as meaning uh, July. And, uh, and we, he left, uh, Hannibal left on this boat journey where he meets uh, Antiochus um, uh, in, well, well he's, he's uh, celebrating a festival. Um, um, and, uh, and after a brief stay at, at Antioch, uh, he met the prince at Daphne. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, there are various ways of, of calculating the date from uh, from uh, he left in in July. Yeah, and uh, uh, he he Livy describes it as a, after a favourable journey, you know, which we can presume to mean a swift one, an incident free. Um, uh, you know, he he ends up at Daphne. Whilst uh, whilst uh, the uh, uh, the festival is being uh, uh, celebrated, and so um, uh, this this works in well with, to support the date of August uh, for the for the uh, celebration of the festival, and incidentally, <clears throat> the the uh, year of one nine five. Um, rules out the the, uh, the 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 festival at Delphi seems to be annual, yeah, um, and that's that's uh, uh, supported by um, this Emperor Julian, yeah, who who who, who was uh, um, uh, saying that the the, the uh, it was celebrated in the tenth month, and the implication is every year a uh, date of one nine five. If if you have one uh, six six for the festival, or even if you have one one six uh, seven or, or 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 five, yeah, uh, it makes it the festival uh, an annual festival uh, rather than a pentaric festival. And uh, so, I think that uh, that it's uh, that it's uh, was uh, uh, celebrated uh, in August. Uh, and uh, and every year, and so that's 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 really you know all as I as I can see it, that that that's all concerning the date. Uh, but we can talk about the other other aspects of the festival, uh, military uh, stuff. I I I don't understand. I I uh, I uh, I don't um, I don't uh, I don't uh, think. That there's any way of knowing for certain what the what the purpose of the of this parade was, yeah. It seems that uh, it seems to be um, um, uh, a one-off parade. Yeah, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem that the parade happened every year. It's a big event where, where um, um, uh, Polybius specifically, uh, I think it's Polybius. Sent uh, or Athenaeus, yeah, uh, tells us that uh, he sent he sent out uh, embassies and theory, uh to the states of, uh, of Greece, but I, I don't think there's any any uh, way of uh, establishing for certain, uh, you know, what uh, uh, what the what the purpose of the of the parade was. I think that's the that's the. The the that's the only thing that I want to say in this in this particular moment. Okay. 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 Thank you, Nick. I mean, it's it's interesting because we already have some disagreements, so that's that's terrific. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Thank exactly. you, Nick. And, and we'll we'll be coming back. It, to it would be boring if we could agree about everything. Uh, you know? We wouldn't be having this discussion if there was nothing. No, to no. Discuss. Okay. So we'll now call for our last speaker on Altai. Um, I'll take doesn't again doesn't need any introduction, but I'll say anyway a few shameless plugs that he's the co-host of this Seleucid lecture series, that he's sort of the master entrepreneur of this field, um, who has created all sorts of things, including the Seleucid study days, and so and we're now um, working on the second volume of Seleucid perspectives, 
when I referred, uh, I, there's a, a, actually all three of our speakers so far have either had articles in Seleucid Perspectives 1 or are about to have them in uh, Seleucid Perspectives 2. Um, and that's a volume that's going to be coming out on uh, the Seleucid military. So I'll, I'll I think that's enough of an introduction. So go ahead. Thank you, Ben. Well, for me, uh, the most difficult is um, not to engage with the previous speaker uh, have already said. Um, we'll keep that for later. Um, and I try to keep it concise. Now, um, over the past 10 years or so, I've had four approaches to the Daphne Parade procession. Um, the first in the run-up to the Brussels um, conference in 2015, Seleucid Study Day 5, Rome and the Seleucid East, when I first knew, well, you cannot do without the Daphne Parade, you uh, need to know a little bit more about it. Previously, my concentration had been on the third century. So I was trying to establish what was that event, when did it happen, and... Uh, um, I found most of the basic ideas already well expressed in uh, in Wallbank's uh, 1996 article, but then developed much further and more profoundly in uh, Nick Secunda's work, uh, which he has summarized here. So I um, I do accept the August 166 date, um, though um, uh, Rolf's uh, alternative uh, interpretation, at least from the the content and ideological perspective remains uh, very attractive. And uh, I would not want to see all of these valuable thoughts abandoned by choosing August and by emphasizing it's likely an Apolline uh, event uh, as Nick has suggested. So there remains a lot of scope for uh, discussion, but that's not what I'm aiming at, at uh, right now. Uh, my second approach, then was uh, when we were going out of the conference at the conference itself and then working on the proceedings uh, writing the conclusion, the epilogue, um, what could we learn uh, from the parade, particularly from a perspective uh, that uh, is just qualified as very outdated, namely the question, how strong, how weak, um, or as I'd like to say, borrowing from, from Rolf, how resilient the um, Seleucid kingdom was, uh, Daphne shows it at its fullest strength. Um, and I will have more details to, um, to, to underline this, but uh, I, I differentiated, or we, we could differentiate three sides, a material side, um, since uh, the Seleucids were often said to have been impoverished, especially as a result of their defeat at uh, Magnesia and the conditions of Apamea we see an astounding amount of wealth exhibited here. But uh, no less important is, uh, are the political, diplomatic and ideological um, implications. We see the Seleucid king well connected with the many, many embassies being sent. Um, and uh, though a question is, why is there no explicit reference to Rome except for the Roman military contingent. Um, so um, that, that remains an open question. If there were Roman ambassadors, uh, why would they not have been mentioned uh, and, and singled out in our reports, which do have an interest in the Roman perspective? Anyways, we see strength and we see creativity here. Um, that's also a sign of strength, drawing on traditions, but playing with them very flexibly and really putting something on stage that is quite spectacular. And then third comes the military potential, the military forces that here are put on stage. And um, these aspects I then develop further in the run up for Seleucid Study Day 7 on the Seleucid Army, co-organized with my friend Nick um, at Sopot near Gdansk in 2019, and then developed further through the Seleucid Lecture Series and in the volume that I'm co-editing uh, with Ben and to which uh, many of uh, those who are joining us today are contributing. So um, uh, my third and my fourth approach focuses on the military list. Um, and uh, initially I had an interest, uh, I thought so much has been said recently about the Macedonians and ethnic constructs among Macedonian units. Um, so I refer to um, uh, Dale John Hull's work and uh, also David Engel's work. Um, and I thought, 
Well, enough about the Macedonians. I don't have anything about uh, them to say, but look, let's look at the, the, the external units, often called the mercenary units. They are named, um, well, especially as the Galatians, the Thracians, the Mysians. Um, and I was wondering how much ethnic hybridity or ethnic construction we might have in these units. How old were they? If they were fresh, they would probably have been recruited recently from um, their home areas. If they were um, uh, older, then they might have needed refills and very often, or the most plausible thought for such refills would have been local recruitments into these units, potentially leading to new ethnic constructs. I have, well, this is still an open thought. I have not concluded this, but it's uh, always in the back of my mind because in my recent work on the uh, Seleucid Perspectives Volume 2, uh, I'm confronted with excellent studies, again, by Nick, um, but also by John Serrati and, um, and uh, Graham Wrightson, who is with us today, Paul Giostono. And there are so many different arguments as to how the Macedonian units, that's the Phalangites in particular, were actually recruited. Who were these men? And I tried to learn uh, most recently, a bit more about these Macedonians by focusing on the silver shields. Um, and they are, they are mentioned here in the uh, the list um, describing the Daphne parade is one of our prime sources of the silver shields. Um, and uh, I try to keep it short, but I think I have something um, intriguingly new to say on this which uh, would uh, have further ramifications. If you look into uh, paragraph five of the text, oh, and I've forgotten to share the handout. Uh, that is, um, Ben, can you quickly put um, a link? You cannot do it. Um, well, it would take too long uh, for those who have the text ready. Otherwise I, I, will, for, um, I will send it after I have said uh, what I wanna say. I apologize for this. Um, so um, in the description of Polybius, uh, which is uh, which is book 30, chapter 25, um, starting in paragraph one, uh, which is on the Daphne Parade, our main source, uh, in paragraph five, we read, and now we have to be cautious. What is it that we are reading? Are we reading the text with the conjecture of Kaibel, which is now in the later text editions and in some of the older and in some of the, uh, the youngest editions. And that would then speak of 20,000 Macedonians, 10,000 gold shields, 5,000 bronze shields, and the rest silver shields. So that is... Um, I don't know uh, why someone, <laughs> okay. Uh, that was me trying to help, that was me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, um, so that is how you read it in the recent Loeb edition. Um, and it's also the revised view of, uh, of Wallbank. Um, it is, uh, however, not the view that Wallbank held in his famous commentary where he rejected the uh, edition by Kaibel and Nick also rejected this edition in his 2006 uh, book, where we would then um, read of 20,000 Macedonians, 5,000 bronze shields and other silver shields. Now, the, the views based on this unchanged text, um, um, also uh, including that of Bar Kokhba, say that there were 20,000 regular phalangites Macedonians, a uh, near homonymous term for this, 5,000 bronze shields, and it's uh, uh, there are many well question marks about who they are, and then other silver shields. Um, and it has been proposed that the number is either 10,000 to match the 10,000 sil near 10,000 silver sheaves, shields attested at Raffia in 217 under Antiochus III, or um, uh, as also by Kokhba followed by, by Nick 
um, have suggested, in fact, the 10,000 have been reduced um, as a result of an army reform. Um, and we have at the very beginning of the parade in paragraph three, 5,000 young men in the prime of life dressed in Roman chainmail armor. Um, so they led the way. Um, and uh, that these would be the other half of the Royal Guard. Um, so I disagree with this interpretation because we read explicitly in the description that those Romans or those, uh, th those Roman style soldiers were in the prime of their life. They were very young, they were fresh recruits. Um, whereas Argyraspides, uh, so silver shields were by tradition always recruited from seasoned veterans. That is what made their strength and their value since the days of Alexander. Um, and uh, so I cannot accept this equation, uh, which also is not supported in any way by the text and uh, would be um, right, quite spe speculative. I suggest, now that's uh, my new proposal, that the text as we have it is correct and that the chi after the 20,000 Macedonians is not the typical end, but it's one of the rarer usages as explicative, an explanation, which we would translate with namely. So 20,000 Macedonians, namely 5,000 bronze shields and the other silver shields. That would not just accept the text as it is, which doesn't need blame. And it would also uh, do away with the anomaly that the silver shields are the only ones, the only unit that is not numbered. We have numbers for all others and the silver shields are the elite unit. They are spectacular. Why would they not be numbered? If I should be right, we would have 20,000 equaling 5,000 bronze and 15,000 silver shields. That's the largest, largest ever attested number of silver shields. Whoever thinks that I'm extremely speculative here, I would refer back to the description to pull, uh, um, of the Battle of Magnesia, um, which we only have in the version of Livy. And there we have another problem we have a total of soldiers identified before the, um, the, the, before the combat, still at Tuatera, um, of around 62,000 foot soldiers. Uh, no, no, sorry, 60,000, uh, roughly 60,000 foot soldiers. But then when it comes to the description uh, um, the, um, of the battle line, um, if we count together all the units, we have around 45,000. And again, the only ones that are not numbered are the silver shields. And scholars have always said, well, the silver shields must be 10,000, as at Raffia. There are a few exceptions, and I think uh, Graham has uh, suggested only 3,000. I suggest we make it the full difference. 60 minus 45 makes it 15, 15,000, which means that Antiochus III had already brought up the number of the elite guard to 15,000, which is roughly the size of a full phalanx, 15 to 16,000, which means the doubling of the core Macedonian phalanx had already uh, gained shape under Antiochus the, um, the, the third with one of regular, sometimes fresh recruits from amongst the Macedonians and one elite veteran phalanx, the core of the phalanx. Um, and that was, I think, still the case under, um, Ant uh, under Antiochus IV. And this elite unit was then presented. And other units presented in the parade were somewhat more exotic, valuable external specialist forces or a selection of um, the cavalry and the full silver shields. And I don't have time to discuss the options for the bronze shields. And I've already said by implication that there were no gold shields. None of them have ever been attested for 
the Seleucid army. If that is granted, we see in the Daphne parade, not just that the empire, the kingdom was brimming, but that Antiochus was building up the strongest ever um, Seleucid army, uh, which fits in well with his universalist uh, approaches with a complete revival of the kingdom with his, well, with his plan, with his um, endeavor to reunite and uh, to uh, rebuild um, and strengthen his authority also over all the parts of the East. While, as Rolf has clearly said, the Daphne Parade was mainly sending out messages into the Mediterranean world that is West. Um, so that's uh, what I would conclude from the, uh, the well, the, or for the Daphne Parade, for the kingship of Antiochus the, um, the, the fourth by looking specifically into the military units. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Altai. Um, so now it's time for questions. Um, I'm, I'd like to take the privilege of being the host and ask a couple of questions first, also because I have to go in a few minutes, unfortunately. Rolf, I'd like to ask you a question first. By the way, thank you, all, all of you. And this model clearly works. It's, this is a wonderful model. I'm sure we'll do it again. Rolf, a couple of questions for you. Um, um, the way the way you think is the way I think about religious and political. We have these categories, but is that the right way to think? Um, that is, isn't the, especially in a polytheistic empire, aren't the two so intertwined that you almost can't pull them out? That is, yes, it has all these religious. It was in a religious place, uh, after all. But but aren't uh, isn't one the function of the other? Aren't they intertwined? And before you answer that, one more question. Um, you were saying, well, at this point, Rome was not the dominant power that it would it would become. And and we, you know, you referred to the Treaty of Apamea. And for a long time I thought that it did apply to Antiochus IV. Now I understand it's simplistic to think that it's too literal. It doesn't matter whether the treaty still applied to Antiochus IV. He was still under that rubric. I mean, think of the day of Eleusis, how he he went skedaddling when Rome came. So even if he wasn't under the terms of the of, of the treaty, and clearly he wasn't, because you're right, he's got elephants, right? He wasn't allowed elephants, and he had elephants in that procession. So my two questions to you, Rolf, are, right, um, is, is separating out the religious um, using our categories? And the other one was, even though you say Rome wasn't what it was going to become, it was pretty pretty much there, um, Antiochus was still under their thumb, wasn't he? Mm. Well, thank you. Um, stop, can I, stop. Can I just quick uh, drop the note that the handout, which is the text yeah. of Polybius in translation, can now be downloaded from the chat box. Just one link. Sorry for the interruption. Way to go. Thank you. I saw this. I saw this come by. No, I don't think you can. You can. You can. Um, you can separate it. So I, I, I emphasize that because I think that the religious aspects have been. Um, not very much at the forefront, but of course I didn't mean to see that as a as a special category. Now, on the contrary, um, and as regards Rome being the dominant power or not, um, I think that Polybius clearly saw, rightly saw, that Rome was the dominant power in the Mediterranean. But I also think that in the Near East, people did not really know that yet. And I also think that, that uh, Antiochus at this moment was not that very much under the thumb of Rome. He was just preventing conflict, perhaps until um, he uh, had been able to make his big anabasis to the east, pick up again tens of thousands of Iranian cavalry, bring in new elephants, um, and perhaps perhaps um, 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 start a new conflict with, uh, with Rome. That's speculation. Um, but I don't think he was very much under the, under the thumb of Rome and the day of Eleusis, is, is a very problematic uh, thing. He wanted to prevent conflict, but he was not. But, uh, but he, he had accomplished. He had accomplished the conquest of Egypt. Yes, he had got it. He was almost completely finished, and he walked away. Isn't that isn't that deferring to Rome? <laughs> um, it's, it's 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 referring to Rome in so far that at that moment he had to uh, prevent a conflict, notably because Macedonia had been defeated shortly before at Pitna, so the Romans were, they had their hands free. 
but I, I, I don't think he's a client of the Romans or a vessel. But there are problematic parts in this in this thing. Okay, uh, thank you. We always have if you try to think. Okay, thank you. And my other question is to to uh, Nick and Stephen. Um, there was a discussion about how special was this event, right? And I wonder if you can split the difference. That is, there is some kind of annual festival, and this year he takes the structure of that festival and builds it up in, into a proportion that it's never been before. Because there does seem, Stephen, to be something very special about this event, right? That this wasn't just business as usual. And all of those emissaries that we're referring to and going out to everybody and all the Greeks anxious to come and see, it feels like the fact that this is being played up is because it was very unusual, but could it also be true that it was within the, stru the annual structure of that festival? I'm asking both of you that. Go on, after, after you, after you, please, Nick. Oh well, I, I agree. That it's it seems to me that uh, that uh, um, he you know his activities you know were sort of like uh, you know uh, given that is it on, on this one occasion that the uh, it seems that the the festival at Daphne was uh, celebrated uh, celebrated annually, but on this one occasion he uh, he. Uh, you know, pulled out all the stops. You know, you wouldn't you will concentrate the uh, the the land on the, you know, bar any anything else, the expense, yeah. Uh, every year. Uh, he 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 sort of there's no doubt about it that the, the major components of the of the land on were, were assembled. Um uh, uh, but and uh, I, I think this all points this all points to this being a very special occasion. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I guess my question that might push back would be, what does business as usual mean? And actually, obviously this is special and it's special because it's written down and it survives. I think the comparative perspective that I, I sometimes see this through is that Daphne here might be slightly different. And I think whenever you have a regular event, there are going to be contemporary colorings to it that are affected by things that have happened. Not least because literally the same thing that's repeated every year could be interpreted differently as a result of something that's happened at a particular moment, right? The, con the context is going to do it. I think that the question I have really is, we tend to see Daphne as a special standalone thing. I have a feeling that things like Daphne would have happened elsewhere in the empire at different points of time. When troops come together, entrances and exits into cities, those kinds of moments are times when similar kinds of things are, are happening um so yeah I, I guess that's that's maybe where i'd say there is a, a broader context for this and it's just we don't have the evidence for it and i guess the pushback would be well if we don't have the evidence for it can we think that it happened or not but i think every time you have an army on the march you have opportunities for this to display to display power um so yeah i i am absolutely all for splitting the difference and seeing daphne this specific moment as being different and that opens up interesting conversations about why it's different and things like that but I, I i think i don't want to go as far as saying this isn't something that i think never happens elsewhere at any other point if that makes sense okay, okay all time turning it over to you and I, I made you host uh thank you uh so okay i am now turk tur uh, so i'm now taking over because you have to leave right um, I would suggest then that um, each of the four presenters uh, now has a chance to engage briefly with one thought or two thoughts of what um, the other speakers have said um, and give it a few minutes each um, before we then open the floor to discussions uh, from the floor, uh, which would give Rolf the opportunity to to comment on one or two points that others have made, um, to comment, to ask questions, or to contradict, as as you wish. Okay, thank you. Um, well, let, let me think for for, for one one second. I, I do do believe if this is a recurrent thing. 
um, but not specifically on this scale. We also had the question that that was brought up in your introduction, Ben, um, on on um, is this internal or or external? And there, of course, the, the thing is, even if you think it's Mediterranean or Aegean, that doesn't really necessarily mean it's it's external. And we have the issue of uh, reacting to the Romans. Paulus was uh, was brought up by uh, by Stephen. Uh, at his festival in Amphipolis, uh, yes, I do believe that that Polybius. Uh, I, I believe what Polybius says it is a, that it is a reaction to that, but not a copy. The festival of Paulus in Amphipolis was not a Roman festival; it was a Greek festival, and that festival too. Um, there, Paulus took on the role of an Hellenistic king, creating a huge festival after a victory. Uh, with the aim of attracting embassies of the Greek cities to his to his person in order to negotiate with them, and I think the Daphne festival, at least in this 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 grand scale that Antiochus made of it, is a response to that. Why? Because Antiochus is doing exactly the same. He's trying to attract these uh, embassies of these same cities to his center. I'll leave it by that because. Others will also like to say things. Okay, uh, perhaps I can jump quickly on that train um, uh, in response to those who say that, um, well, this is probably a more of a usual event than an unusual event. I agree with uh, Stephen when you say there were many parades and festivals in all cities every year. The um, armies were on the march. Uh, more often than once, even though one might question how often were they on the march, uh, I mean, a large full-scale royal army, how how often were, had they been on the march um, after uh, Apamea? Um, that was relatively limited, as far as we know, for the Seleucid Kingdom. But most um, of all, the um, the embassies, the, the press base, Kai uh, Theorus or Theoroi, um, of such a large number, uh, and even then their inclusion into the parade itself, that's perhaps the most unusual ever, which would mark out the event above um, most other uh, similar or comparable events. So something spectacular and very special is going on, as also the, well, our witnesses have noticed, um, I think, uh, Rolf, it was in your slides where you quoted uh, Diodor that uh, that the, the, the king put his whole, uh, well, that, that Antiochus put his whole kingdom on the stage. So it was, I think, noticed as something very unusual. Um, as you, by the way, uh, Stephen, in your wonderful article in the SP1 volume also, show the very unusual role that Antiochus took in, well, in, in arranging as kind of a stage director during the event itself, showing up here and there and thereby, well, manifesting himself as Theos Epiphanes, uh, which as we all know was his, his title. So there, um, I think we should see the whole, the, the, the two sides together, that there are standard celebrations, parades, um, um, which are reoccurring for whatever reasons on the one hand, but this was then used for something very special and, and unique. Um, that's how I would uh, respond to this point. Um, now, uh, next, uh, I think, St Stephen, uh, would you like to? Yeah, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, just to pick up on your last point, I do definitely think that there are things about this where we can imagine that there's a unique or something different. And I think the way I see this example being different is in the troop composition, the way that the people at the front of the parade are precisely those people who are from regions from which the Seleucids are theoretically excluded. And there's a moment here to kind of reiterate um, Seleucid kind of control. Um, I guess one thing I maybe just wanted to clarify in response to I'll take kind of you picking up on something I had said about a strong be weak and it being old fashioned. Um, I guess what I wanted to kind of reiterate about that is that 
I think I'm just a little bit suspicious of grand narratives, big grand narratives, particularly big grand narratives, which come down to us from a particular period of time. And I think if we're serious about decolonizing, um, whatever word you want to use for decolonizing, um, the field, we need to think about our own structures of knowledge and why we ask the questions that we do. And the reason that I have written everything that I've written that says about Strong v. Weak is because every time I've written something, a reviewer has expected me to ground it in Strong v. Weak. And in the UK, we're dealing with the rec context where we have to have academic wriggle, which means setting all of this in. And and I guess I, I think we need to just be aware of where these questions originate and why the field has taken the shape it has. Not necessarily say they're old-fashioned, um, but I, I think sometimes because we have got so few pieces of evidence for the Seleucids, there's a temptation for us to want to connect all of the dots and create lines between all the dots. And I think sometimes it's okay for the dots to be standing on their own. Um, yeah. Well, um, that that is uh, a very valuable um, uh, and very valid uh, thought, uh, Stephen. Um, and uh, I do, well, we are not that far apart here because what I was trying to do was to deconstruct the prevailing grand narrative of the ongoing and constant Seleucid decline, which started with the death of Seleucid, uh, Seleucus I as the founder. And you still find that either consciously and explicit or subconsciously in so many, um, well, side note, sub clauses um, of the accounts uh, that, that, that you find. Um, and so I was trying to to work against this, though perhaps then shifting um, a little bit uh, towards the other side, emphasizing a strength, even though what I my, my preferred notion is that of resilience, um, understanding that an empire can be very strong and very weak, and even at the same time in different places, that is what an empire actually is. It's uh, it's uh, it's a very um, difficult to grasp entity, and it can. When an, uh, the, well, what, what makes an empire is the ability to concentrate and uh, to to organize forces that can be overwhelming in one point uh, in time and place, yet then um, being showing weakness in other places at the same time. That is actually what an empire is, um, which takes it beyond the grand narratives of universalist power and and so on. So, um, and your your. Uh, uh, your um, uh, thought helps me to articulate that more clearly. So it's it's uh, very well taken. Thank you. Can I just, can I just very quickly on that? Because obviously I was not, wasn't criticizing your work or anyone's work in particular. It's more, I think, because I've been writing the introduction to, to my monograph fairly recently. I think I was just struck when you read monographs, anything that's written in the last 10, 15 years, we all cite literally the same page numbers. We all, you know, when you write the introduction of a book like that, you, we all know which bits we're going to cite. We're all going to say, you know, here's Tarn, the crustacean, the empire without a shell. It's fair. We all cite the same things. And I think it's just trying to liberate ourselves from that mindset. And what you, the way you've just expressed it there is so much more nuanced. And then we somehow, we have all these nuanced ideas, but then we put ourselves back in this box because we're feeling like we've got to explain how our work relates to what's just gone before us. And that's to do with the structures of the way that the academia is developed. But I think the way you've just expressed things is something that I'd very much get on board with. And the idea of empires rising and falling and having good spells and bad spells and all of those kinds of things, I think is a much more productive way, way to go. Thank you, yes. Well, um, Nick, can I turn to you um, and ask you if you have a critical question um, or I'm sure you do, because I'm sure you do not like very much my interpretation of uh, uh, the army units. It is challenging your, um, well, at least parts of your argument of the uh, grand Roman army reform under uh, Antiochus IV. So uh, if uh, not elsewhere, oh. you might perhaps enter in a discussion. Uh, well. No, I, I, I don't think he criticizes it at all because the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, five thousand Roman infantry uh, uh, at the head of the trade are uh, would be young men, yeah, 
they would have been uh, uh, retrained in through the Phoebe training program. You know, the, 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 the idea that this is a this is a guard regiment is is a non you know it doesn't it, it, it's a suggestion of Mark Kochba, but you know it's uh, he, made, he made many other suggestions, but the the uh, the uh, uh, it's easy to see them as uh, uh, a contingent of, of young men and what, what uh, and how they're described. Um, you know, who've been retrained in this uh, in this program, and they're not the elite. Yeah. Um, another thing, you know, um, uh, uh, going back to well, Rolf's point uh, is is uh, you know we we don't know whether this is this is a, uh, uh, the gloss of Polybius or even Athenaeus. In suggesting that this is a reaction to uh, to the Amphipolis games of uh, of uh, Aeneas Paulus, um, you know, it, it, it's it's uh, it's a supposition, but uh, um, you know, it, it, it it's not definite. Yeah, and the other point I'd, I'd like to make is that the uh, the uh, uh, the Mysians, um the Mysians are. Are, uh, I've argued uh, that uh, the Mysians were. Um, there's a mention in uh, in uh, um, an inscription of the uh, of uh, armed forces that uh, that uh, uh, Attalus I think, lent to uh, Antiochus uh, when to guarantee his return. To uh, to uh, to his ancestral kingdom, and these are the Mysians. Yeah, they um, uh, they were loaned by the Pergamene kingdom. Uh, they were originally uh, mercenaries uh, fighting for the uh, for the uh, 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 Attalid kingdom, and they were loaned or or, or passed over. To the Seleucids, and this is why we find them as mercenaries. You know, not as the, not as the, uh, uh, they're permanently standing, yeah, but uh, they're not as, uh, uh, you know, the recruited Macedonian phalanx, the mobilized Macedonian phalanx. This is why we find find them fighting repeatedly in, in, for example, uh, uh, Judea, yeah, afterwards. And so they're a permanently uh, embodied uh, force of mercenaries, which are sort of em employed full time to suppress the uh, the Jewish revolt. Um, and the Cilicians, uh, uh, Cilicia was not uh, was not uh, it was on, on the right part and the right side of the Taurus Mountains. The Seleucids were perfectly. Uh, uh, allowed to uh, to uh, to uh, recruit there. Um, May I interrupt yeah. you for just one moment? Um, I have to leave this building. Uh, all the lights are going out. Uh -huh. So uh, thank you, thank you for having me here, and thank you for organizing this. It's good format. Next, good thank to you see you again. And <laughs> I'm afraid <laughs> I have to go now. So see you, see you all again. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Till till thank soon you. again. Bye Until well. soon. And we'll talk at at, at Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Yes, very good. Hi. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that's a little unfortunate because I was calling on Rolf because, amongst other things, he is also a specialist on the mission. So he and um, his former student uh, Pim Muring have a full chapter on the missions as mercenary forces in the upcoming. Uh, volume which uh, on which they also presented um, at SOPOD in uh, 2019. But um, largely with, uh, um, I think, uh, what you said about the uh, the missions is fully agreeable, uh, what you've said. About, so I find all the points um, agreeable regarding the Cilicians. We do not know where they came from, whether they were from the, well, um, the, the you know, I, I wrote in my popular book that uh, there's a according to Libanius, the Cilicians dedicated a monument monument in Antioch, showing Antiochus taming the bull. 
and the, the bull is an, an allusion to the Tauric Mountains, which Antiochus had cleared of robbers, and the statue was de dedicated by the, the grateful Cilicians in his honour. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it would be a reasonable argument that uh, the, the, the Seleucid monarch was uh, free to recruit in Cilicia. Uh, well, he was uh, free not just to recruit in the Cilician territories that he was possessing, which was, uh, um, well, of course, the, the eastern part um, of Cilicia. But as we know, Cilicia was the name of the whole um, southern Anatolian coast, and, or this, um, and we, we find uh, very confusing or overlapping terminology well into the Roman Empire um, which would include even Pisidians, uh, Lycaonians, um, Carians even could be subsumed under Kilikians. And, um, well, I think I, I uh, made it clear and uh, I am in agreement with you uh, that um, the Treaty of Apamea did only bind legally Antiochus III and no one else legally. It may have been an implica uh, a political implication. And then I went back to the treaty when it comes to sending back soldiers. It's um, the treaty explicitly speaks of cities and uh, it does not make any stipulations about say people who were considered as relatively wild mountain dwellers, um, having them actually withdrawn from the area might even have been seen as a benefit for um, for the new Pergamene rule. So that was not even stipulated in the treaty, uh, which means um, he would have had free hand, especially as long as he was in a friendship relation with Eumenes II, um, and if they had uh, w worked together for mutual benefits. Um, but we may then even go one step further. There have been some points made and uh, uh, that uh, try to, uh, well, pin down or, or to, to tease out local or geographical implications, saying that um, the army units that I named are meant to re reflect either the existing or the claimed kingdom, the previous territory of the kingdom, and I do not think that this is the case. I don't think that there are any territorial claims implied. It's just specialist units or units highly valued. Um, and uh, there is a diversity um, of range implied, even though it's all focusing on the West. And I think um, I would, it's the only non-Western unit that is specified are the uh, Nicene um, um, is the Nicene cavalry, so a selection of 1,000 um, uh, um, cavalry from, from media. Um, and that is probably because that um, special unit was always close to, to the king, I assume, um, so that this could also be paraded. Otherwise, I I'm going to suggest in, uh, in a new approach that... Uh, and Tigers had just recru recruited in the West um, uh, for his upcoming campaign to the East. And then he would be joined on his way by other units uh, from Armenia, from Mesopotamia, from, ba from Media and uh, Parthia. When he, was, when he would go um, all his way, he would then probably recruit further units. And that's how I would explain the imbalance, imbalance if we look at a map and map out the units that are named. That, would that also be agreeable to you, Nick? Totally, but you know, the, the, uh, uh, this, um, the Thracians are all, you know, the Galatians are all, are, are all also present, and uh, we don't know where the Galatians come from. Yeah. We don't know exactly, but, but, it, it, but it, 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 there's uh, there's uh, very plausible evidence for Thracian settlement in uh, in Iran in Persis, and uh, oh. so so they they would be uh, uh, and so they would be um, uh, if they those troops would be may have been 
mobilized from Thracian settlements in Persis. And so it's not, it's not, a, and so it's, it's not as, um, it's not as clear. It, 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 it's exclusively a, uh, a Western based army. And, uh, um, you know, the, the, well, yeah, I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you. Well, that I took note of this. Um, can I now open uh, the floor to questions or comments uh, from anyone in the audience? And I do not see anyone raising hand. If there's, if there's silence, can I ask you guys a question? Sure, I... sure. Yes, please. I wondered how seriously you take the ethnic descriptors of the army, because ultimately, I know it says, you know, these are Thracians or whatever. Ultimately, that's coming from what they're wearing, right? Somebody's looked at that and decided that's who they are. And there's a question about whether that's who they really are, right? And I just well, that's wondered, a very good I was, question. I wonder and... how seriously you take those labels. Um, and of course, uh, Nick will be uh, in a much better position uh, to answer that question. But um, in addition to what he's going to say, because he's an expert of the weaponry for all these contingents, I assume that there were also sign signposts coming with these groups, like in a, in a carnival parade. Uh, these groups would be announced. We do have explicit evidence for something like that on the triumph of Pompeii where um, um, every group and all the achievements then represented to cer uh, by certain groups were named on, uh, on signs written out. And I assume that this was a very practical approach, um, but I, I think there was a combination of national um, uh, arming traditions and uh, Nick, please explain to us uh, how um, Thracian weapons looked like before I then uh, call on Paul, uh, who was trying to speak. Well, I don't know, honestly. Um, but there is, uh, there is, uh, you know, the uh, there's two references in uh, in uh, uh, all. All this is dealt with by Hull in that that, uh, that recent article. Uh, in this, you know, this uh, this volume, yeah. Um, okay, so then I would suggest you will be so kind to circulate that reference after our event, and for now I'm then calling on Paul. Not sure if he has this, to... this colonial geopolitics volume, yeah. Uh, there's there's a, an article by who of this. Uh, of these, uh, the, the, the... you're meaning this one, okay? Yeah, yeah, I think no, but, so. But Google's yeah, article is on the Macedonians, yeah, soldiers and Hellenism recruitment in the Hellenistic militaries, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you know, as I I have argued, but it will be it will pub be published in the in the the volume two of the uh, the, the perspectives, and I argued at the SOPOC conference that. Those those Macedonians were descendants of, of ethnic Mac Macedonians, yeah, which were which were settled in the first years of the of the establishment of the empire, and they were and they, as Macedonians, they uh, had allegiance to serve the Macedonian king. The Macedonian king of Asia was the uh, uh, Seleucus and his descendants, yeah. The uh, Macedonian king of Europe was, uh, you know, the 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 Antigone dynasty. Yeah? We've got very many references to the Macedonian kingdom, with reference to the Seleucid Empire. Yeah, and I think that the system of recruitment um, in in the Seleucid Empire was very very similar, if not identical, to the uh, system of recruitment in, in uh, Antigone of Macedonia, which is exemplified by the, uh, the uh, conscription diagram, yeah? mm -hmm. which is found in the 
in the 1990s, yeah, but it's being worked upon at the moment. And this, and this you know, demonstrates that uh, the, the Macedonians living in European Macedonia had uh, uh, a duty uh, through their allegiance to the monarch to serve. Yeah? And it was the same with the Macedonians living in Asia. Um, yes, yeah, so I can I can announce so I'll, 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 yeah, but that's on the Macedonian. So that is on the Macedonians. Yeah. Um, and uh, I can promise everyone there will be a very strong developed argument by Nick um, explaining uh, this approach uh, conscription, this conscription model. There will also be alternative models um, uh, proposed by other colleagues um, and uh, also some overlap. Um, well, and, well, they're, uh, wrong, the right... they're wrong and I'm right. Well, this is the right is time to call in Paul because Paul <laughs> is um, will be arguing in our volume for a more diversified approach. And um, so the question that Nick has raised now is whether we have racially, in a more narrow sense, Macedonians serving in uh, the Macedonian units of the Seleucids or whether Macedonian has developed into a social status um, also open to other recruits. Um, but that was actually not the question that Stephen uh, had asked because he was asking about the non-Macedonian units here, specifically the Thracians, the Galatians, how would they have looked like? Um, and I will uh, I will try to find something later to, uh, to uh, send his way. But now, uh, Paul, um, Please. Uh... Yeah, sure. So uh, I had a question I was going to ask eventually, but a couple of comments on those things. So in my chapter in the uh, volume volume two, I'll, I'll also talk about uh, conscription and other methods of recruitment, how Seleucids put armies together, because uh, I think it's, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of room for discussion and something like the conscription diagram could be possible in some parts of the kingdom, but may not have been used in others. Uh, and so some of that will explore some of that complexity. On the question of the ethnic units, I don't think it is necessary even to imagine that they had a national panoply. Uh, we see in the Ptolemaic evidence, for example, the labeling of certain uh, regiments that were probably armed essentially as Thuriophoroi or Thoracotai uh, giving them the names of the the Pamphylians or the Mysians uh, or the Thracians. Uh, there's even uh, a unit ad identifier for the Galatians uh, in the context of the revolts in Upper Egypt, where the list of men from the unit and it's just a it's part of a tent group or something uh, includes one name that might be Galatian. Uh, one name that's definitely Mysian, one name that's almost certainly Aetolian, and yet they were part of a unit that had an identity as Galatian. Does that mean they had Galatian weaponry? Maybe, but Galatian weaponry uh, might only have meant that they were Thuriophoroi, or perhaps were Thuriophoroi with Galatian-style throwing spears, the Gaison. It, it doesn't have to be anything particularly out of the realm. Similarly with the Mysians, uh, we have Mysian units with uh, non-Mysian personnel. Uh, we have the example of uh, raising Mysian units even in Pergamon with plenty of Mysians, where some of the personnel in those units are not Mysian. Uh, and then what the Mysian panoply is, is an entirely different question, because there is no coherent Mysian panoply. If we look at uh, depictions of Mysians from funerary steles, uh, we see heavy infantry, light infantry, peltasts, possibly pikemen, and everything in between. The only thing that we don't see much of in the figurative evidence is Mysian archers, which is what appears inscrutably at Magnesia. Why are there 5,000 Mysian archers? And I, it has made me wonder if there's some sort of mistake uh, in, in the text and how it's been transferred um to have five thousand five thousand Mysians who are archers uh at that at that battle um so so in, in my opinion uh you could have the the galatian force i, I think 
because we have the examples of Galatian officers and Galatian units, probably does look typically Galatian. The one feature that might appear among them that would be interesting would be chain mail. Um, although I know uh, a Romanist told me he suspected that the 5,000 at Daphne got their mail by Antiochus buying the mail off of his uh, Galatian infantry uh, settlers. So I don't know. Uh, but I thought that was a funny, funny notion. Um, the manufacture of mail in the Seleucid East would be a, an interesting question. I wish we knew more. Uh, but the Thracians would presume, like, that may essentially be uh, heavily armored peltas. So there's, you know, if, if we look at the Kazanluk tomb, you know, they're, they're proto uh So I don't know how much we need to differentiate the Thracians even. Um, and then my question, so I'll throw this out, related to the silver shields. I, Alte, I believe it was you who suggested that the silver shields should be veteran, a veteran pike regiment uh, recruited from older experienced phalangites. I see the connection with Alexander, but if we look at the Peltas Corps as it's treated in Seleucid military history, especially in the campaigns of Antiochus III, or if we look at the comparative evidence, especially from the Antigonids, the Peltas, the elite Peltas Corps seems to be drawn from a semi-elite stratification of society and to be young men, uh, which I think fits with the 5,000 armed in the Roman manner, if the Seleucid, if, if, if that, you know, so I could, I could see different ways of talking about the Seleucids, but how would you defend the uh, Alexander and successors era silver shields as veteran soldiers against the evidence from Antiochus III or Antigonid evidence for your Peltasti as young men from good families? So there the answer is relatively easy. First, um, we have only one attestation of Peltastai or Peltast in the Seleucid army, as you know, in the campaign of Tapuria around 208 uh, BCE in the Anabasis of Antiochus III. And, well, it's just a random assumption that they are silver shields. They they should not be considered silver shields. We don't know. Uh, uh, be, so they are, well, we, they are called Peltastai, not Argyraspides first. Second, they are used to, um, well, for a night march. Um, uh, you, you wrote about it because that also, that, that started me to look into, into this and then you equated the units, but Pelt well, silver sheets, shields are by definition not Peltastai because uh, the Pelte is a very light version of the shield. And uh, so this allows for some more flexibility and for some uh, more, say, um, forced marches, which silver shields with a heavier silver shield and also with the long pike would probably not be able to do even less so when they were old veterans. Um, so that would be my response to this. We, um, when we see silver shields in action, it's nearly always in the um, in the phalanx as the elite phalanx that that withstand. Um, yeah, you want to uh, re respond? Yeah, sorry. One of the places I was thinking of as peltas is actually Yuzonoi. So when they engage in uh, forced marches over rough terrain, uh, in I believe this is in the fourth Syrian war, they're characterized as Yuzonoi uh, and contrasted with the heavier phalanx under uh, the carcass. Um, and so in that in that instance as well, they're not called peltasts. Uh, they are uh, clearly uh, a, a lighter and more agile unit. Uh, able to do this rapid march through rough terrain, similar to what we see the Peltas and Macedonian usage do, who also are equipped with the, ex I mean, it's the exact same shield. I mean, I think this, I think the studies are clear enough that the, the Peltas shield is, is essentially the same as the, the, Maced the Macedonian Aspis, so they're interchangeable names. Or at least yes, that's my but, but when you add a silver plate on it, it gets heavier. 
uh, if you add silver on the on the leather cover. Um, of course, uh, the question is how thick the layer was and whether there was actually bronze underneath, and that was then fortified with silver. But I think it was uh, heavier because it uh, had a metal cover. Um, so I would need to see the evidence that really the unit that you are claiming as silver shields are called silver shields and then are uh, presented as being more agile. So um, th that's where I have the concern. I do not claim continuity from the units of Alexander um, because they were destroyed uh, under, uh, well, after Eumenes' uh, uh, captivity, they were destroyed by Antigonus I in around 316. What I will claim in the article that I'm currently writing, and I, I will be very happy to throw, uh, to throw the first draft uh, at you, um, uh, is that Antiochus III reintroduced a veteran unit um, trying to collect pick to pick pick veterans from all over his kingdom as the silver shield as their first mention in Polybius in the context of Rafa are named so um well picked men from all of the kingdom or from in, in the first place and then from from all of Syria uh in in the second place and that is something that makes sense if you want to draw on seasoned already settled veterans and uh, want to build a new army with them rather than recruiting Macedonians in the nearest cities or in the nearest near settlement areas. And then giving them the famous name of the Argyraspides um, because of their old experience and loyalty. And by definition, I would say they, they would be in their 30s, perhaps exceptionally in their 40s, we should reject the, the age indications that we find uh, for the units of Eumenes and in, in, in Plutarch. Um, one can easily explain uh, there they are called uh, minimum 60, mostly 70 or older, which is just nonsense. Um, but that would make them really a veteran unit and you cannot do all the things with them, but they would stand, they would hold the ground. Uh, they would be able to deal with more difficult uh, uh, terror. They would be able to uh, to reform much more easily. All the things we read about them. Um, and uh, so does that kind of satisfies you for the moment? Or at least makes you curious to, to read my full argument? And perhaps you can do me the favor and send me the reference uh, to the... Um, to the, uh, well, other assumed uh, uh, unit of uh, Argyraspides. Sure, sure. You, uh, and and yeah. you made many points at the beginning, well, when, um, when you started um, uh, your, uh, your contribution and you were talking about the ethnically labeled groups in different armies and you are inclining to say that largely we need not assume either an ethnic identity of the uh, of the man or a national and, and you even raised doubts about uh, the armor whether that armor was ethnically defined i think you are very progressive in this regard if i consider conservative those who claim ethnic identity and uh, national traditions for the, those ethnically labeled units that was the traditional assumption for at least for all who are not Macedonians. I think the Macedonian question was always a different one. Um, but for the uh, the mercenaries, the experts, uh, um, the, the debates are much more recent. Um, and uh, I agree, I concede to you, we should reckon with much more flexibility and we know better from uh, Roman uh, conditions when we have ethnically labeled units such as Iturians or his, uh, his, uh, Hispani um, names of these units of these cohorts would continue sometimes for centuries while they had been dislocated and were in very different areas of the Mediterranean Sea. And there is no indication that recruitment into these units uh, would be done from the named home area. So that is a starting point. And then the Tarentines, there seems to be agreement that 
around 200 uh, BCE units of Tarentine uh, equestrians were no longer recruited from Tarentum, uh, but were a specialized cavalry unit. Uh, so there it's fully conceded, and it, I think it's no longer controversial. What I would suggest cautioning your very progressive approach a little bit is to look into time and place. Is it plausible that at that time, a unit may have been freshly recruited from, say, Galatia? Or as Nick has done for the, um, for the Mysians, uh, Nick and Rolf, the connection, the connection with the Atalid kingdom uh, and uh, the, well, the transfer or the support for Antiochus IV uh, very recently before is so obvious that I would still see the local connection, but wonder how many of those original missions would still be around in 166 when the unit uh, was uh, sent on its mission to Syria in 175. So there the question begins as to whether uh, they had been reinforced locally. And we may also ask what, what armor had they been bearing? Had they all been armed in the very same way when they were accompanied? That, that's not useful. You do not need a guard um, um, well, of uh, 5,000 soldiers all having the same armor. You need some diversity. And a similar question is can be raised for the Roman unit. 5,000 men. Is that a regular uh, um, Roman legion? But if it were, we know that there were at least three different categories of um, the, the Velites, the Principes, and the Triarii with some different armor, different ages, different fighting styles. So that's a question we cannot answer uh, when it comes to the consistency of the Roman style armed unit at the beginning of the Daphne parade. So I, I uh, uh, the, the bottom line is that I concede a lot to you and I am in uh, uh, agreement with Mary, many of your observations, but I would still give much room for ethnically defined units recruited in home areas where historically it makes sense. But then when we read that these great kings had such a wide variety of um, contingents they could draw, draw on and they wanted to be able to draw on. I think that this then fostered a specialization which may not have been natural for these uh, uh, units naturally in their home areas where there too may have been much more diversity in uh, their armor. But then in the service, in the longer term service of say uh, the, the Seleucid or Ptolemaic kings, they would probably have um, developed into a more uniform style armored unit. That's my assumption. I do not have evidence for it. Does that make sense as a response to? Oh, yeah. No, and I mostly am just trying to make sure that we're careful with all of the possible range of options yes. more than trying to say what I think definitely was happening. Yeah, that makes. No, I need to go get my computer plugged in, so I'll be off away for just a minute. If anybody else wants to rip what I said apart, uh, but yeah. Thanks, right. Paul. Um, anyone else who has not yet have a chance had a chance to uh, ask a question or make a comment. I uh, I wanted to chime in on the um, uh, high pacifist versus argiraspid context, uh, as I'm sure you guys would imagine um but uh i i go with paul's version more that these are um this is an elite unit whether it's coming from the original macedonian version of soldiers from the phalanx or later um it's created from the aristocratic sons i don't think that really necessarily changes um, how the unit is used militarily, all our battles seem to suggest that this is an elite unit that accompanies the king. Um, and uh, they're unlike your argument, as I said, I think they're smaller following the same context that you see in all the contemporary versions of the Antigonids and um, the Ptolemy. 
Macedonians and the Macedonians, um, the early Macedonians. So whether it's 3,000 or 5,000, the as the parade shows, Seleucids seem to like 5,000 as their number, as opposed to three being the number that the early Macedonians like um, in 3,000. But I, uh, so whether they're settlers or not, sons of aristocrats, as Paul says, or elites from the regiment, I don't think that necessarily matters. But what I think is important is that they, yes, they are silver shields. They could be peltasts as they function in the, um, in the Macedonians. And I think that's just a question of each nation's terminology for the same unit that they inherited from the early Macedonians. So Hypaspists, Pedzotiroi before that, then they become Peltasts, then they become Silver Shields. It's just a term for them. Silver Shields are created, as you know, from the retirement of previous Hypaspists who are given Silver Shields and then sent away. And I disagree with you. I think they are over 60 or at least burning on 50 at least. Um, they're survivors of the original campaign under Philip. Uh, so they've been around for a long time and Spartans retired at 60. So we assume that soldiers were able to fight into their 60s. So anyway, that's a separate issue. Um, but uh, I think the shield question, we uh, you mentioned that they fight with the pike. Um, I think most people forget that these, as I've argued elsewhere, these elite units are trained to fight both as pike phalanxes. But if the situation requires it, then they use their spear and their shield as a hoplite, which is where the lighter armament peltast staff comes in, where they can cover mountains and rivers and so on with smaller spears, um, which is, as Paul said, uh, where we see them used in, in these different environments in all the different kingdoms at the same time. They all fight in the same way. So uh, the Daphne parade doesn't mention the silver shields. I've always assumed it was because people that's that's the regular elite regiment. So people know already how much that is. They don't have to provide the numbers for it. Like that in, in Macedon under Alexander, it was 3,000 and it's specifically that all the way through. Uh, and when they lose some, they reintegrate some. Um, so that's that's just an option I thought I'd throw out for the numerical discussion. But I think the, this, is, this is the elite unit. If you take the silver shields, as you do, to refer to all the Macedonian phalanx, and you take them as veterans in their 30s and 40s, what are the others doing? Where where are the other Macedonian phalanx fighters who are not veterans yet in their 30s and 40s? The, the younger ones, there's got to be, I see a distinction between the regular phalanx and the bronze shields and the silver shields, uh, and the silver shields are the elite unit that accompany the king, um, whether they're aristocrats or not, they're distinct from the phalanx itself and i could go on and on about this as you guys know but I'll, uh, no it's it's very that. good to have your questions and i think i i have answers uh to most of uh of your concerns um and again i will throw my my uh draft at you but uh just uh so the things that i remember um that i uh uh may uh respond to i am yet to see that there is evidence for the silver shields to be drawn from the wealthier um, citizens. It's based on the assumption that you can compare it with the Peltastai of the Antigonid army. And that's your inference. I have, so I'm going through the evidence for the silver sheets. I've never seen that assumption. What I've clearly seen is we have veterans. And that is, that seems to be a persistent, uh, persistent uh, assumption, either explicit or implicit. Second, where would we expect the sons of the wealthier Macedonians in the cavalry? Mm -hmm. And I think the Politai, the Politai cavalry mentioned also in the Daphne parade are the sons of the wealthier, um, of the wealthier Macedonians. Um, so that is in a nutshell, my response. We have the, the open questions of who the, the, the bronze shields in the parade, in the Daphne parade were, because it's the only explicit attestation in the Seleucid army. And uh, so um, uh, Nick, not sure if he's here also following uh, Bakochva, uh, but Nick is, uh, has suggested that they are refugees from, uh, from the army of Perseus. I am not actually convinced here. I have a speculation, namely that these 5,000 may in fact be the regular hoplites from Antioch. 
For me, the politi are Antiochians. They are not from all the Macedonian um, uh, cities and settlements, as, as Nick has suggested elsewhere. But I would the numbers make very good sense to have regular hoplite recruits uh, from Macedon as uh, bronze shields. Uh, and uh, the veteran contingent then is that of the whole kingdom that is with the king, the silver shields. So, um, and then we have other units that are local. The Ephebes are 800 Ephebes from the large city of Antioch and the 3000 Politi um, uh, cavalry is the cavalry unit of Antioch. And we need not have the whole regular phalanx uh, or all the potential regular soldiers represented. We have, on the one hand, the elite. We have the specialists that have been recruited for the upcoming campaign. And we have the locals. One might wonder that 5,000 hoplites is a low number uh, for the Antiochians, but uh, compared, to, I mean, compared to 3,000 uh, 3,000 cavalry, um, but we need not we need not claim completion or the the draft of the full the um, or uh, mobilization of all um, possible uh, men. So that would be in brief my uh, my response to you, and I think it will be useful to follow up on that specialist discussion because I did not want to make this a discussion on the Argus, but it is. Yes, actually, I want it, uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. uh, I, I was trying to to then uh, bring back um, the the conclusions to the level of what the Daphne parade actually is and what we learn, uh, what we learn about Antiochus the Fourth, his army and his his uh, political um, and military aims at large. But yes, I'm very grateful for the particular questions and concerns and all the sources you may throw at me but if you would give it another couple of days i will have the the uh, my draft manuscript ready and uh will also send it your way yep sounds good thank you very much does anyone else have a question or a comment i think nicholas does uh yes uh so can to take a step away from the army specifically i kind of want to return to some things uh, both Yorte and also Rolf mentioned, and especially to Stephen's comments, how do we actually understand the Seleucid Empire? Because, I mean, it's we're still kind of within this, there I said, this kind of new Seleucid history, I mean, culture in white, in the way, in the way we understand the Seleucid Empire, whether it's East and Western, strong, weak, resilient or not. But in reality, the, the way we're talking about these empires seems to be at least to to me mostly in the forms of the army the economy and the ideology and as someone more working on the local level um in Babylonia does this suffice because we're, we're missing at the moment at least as the impression I got got I've uh, got we're missing a theory of empire um I think Rolf mentioned network empires but also talked about center and periphery does this work actually for ancient empires? And can we even understand this look at empire based on the sources we have access to, the sources that have been preserved? Well, that's a good set of questions and there is no clear answer to this. First of all, because say our study group does not work with one definition of empire. It mm. would not make sense. Uh, we, we have, well, we are discussing the notion of empires and uh, in my discussion or conversation with uh, Stephen, we've actually um, mentioned a couple of aspects and what your, uh, what your question actually has made very explicit, so much depends on the perspective, empire from the perspective of whom, um, or empire in what context. So I've had, well, controversies with my late friend um, Federico Maria Muccioli, who rejects the notion of empire completely and says, no, that's a Roman term. It's anachronistic. They only speak of Basileia, which we may translate with kingdom, but even there you might say it's anachronistic to even translate. 
that notion. No, I'm not a purist. Um, and most of us are not in, in, in the network that we are working together are not terminological purists, but we try to tease out certain aspects of what it means. The ag agglomeration of power that you have now subdivided in a field of economy, the military field and the ideology. Um, and then said, but hey, where then is the local perspective? Um, but you may yeah. actually subsume, well, all um, local perspectives tie into economic, military and ideological perspectives. And the question is, is all religion ideology? In some sense, yes. In other senses, perhaps not so much. Where does diplomacy, the, well, the the, the physical version of diplomacy uh, tie in, sending out ambassadors physically. Um, it has ideological components and it may also have economic and military implications. Uh, so the network, the notion that, that Rolf likes to work with uh, a network of, of people working together in communication um, and certainly an asymmetric uh, network. It's not that everyone is even. And yet, ultimately, the great king is is depending on the ascend, on the acceptance um, of the lowliest subjects. So it's a very dynamic. I, th I think we are paving the way for a very dynamic understanding um, uh, uh, of, of empire. Um, it's uh, It's not anything monolithic. Um, and we are describing and so many different um, uh, contributions in the lecture series uh, have focused on individual aspects um, or individual perceptions. Um, and it's very difficult to, to come up with one summary, with one narrative, with one master narrative that captures it all. Something will always be missing. Something may always be criticized. Um, or emphasized in different ways. And that pertains to everything in history, to all historical um, uh, reconstructions or constructions as others, others prefer to say. So I hope that this does make sense, even though it may not satisfy you. I cannot give you the guidance of, hey, here's the package to use. That is the catalog of criteria that with all the check boxes to tick because that catalog will look differently in different areas of the kingdom and in also uh, and also at different time at different times um, of the kingdom and also from the very different perspectives local perspectives um regional or court elites mm. dynasty outside players which play a big role in defining uh of what the empire of the Seleucids is from the Ptolemaic perspective, because many of our sources are from the Ptolemaic or Roman perspectives. That all needs to be considered ultimately. Um, anyone else who wants to chime in? Uh, go on, Nicholas. You want to come back? You go back. You come back. No, uh, because the, the, the way I actually, uh, I may phrase it poorly, the way I'm, I'm thinking about this, about how we understand empires more from a historiographical sense. In, in the way as as Stephen also pointed out, kind of this these old debates and these old notions, these old dichotomies, which we keep returning to in in discussions. At least I keep finding always in in the literature, where we seem to be missing a, a theory of empire, and that's I mean for me it's it's frankly I'm I've been trying to do some to get a good decent idea of the historiography of the of Seleucid studies at least, and. I would say the last 10 years is kind of we've moved beyond this this Sherman White's Amelie Kurtz idea of the Seleucid Empire. It's clear. I mean, all the discussions move beyond it, but at the same time, we don't have a new paradigm. And there is no paradigm. And this this absence of paradigm, at least to me, means that the old paradigm still continues in a certain sense, because in we reject it. In, in various localities, in various kind of more specialized areas. But we don't really look at it from a theoretical perspective and then go, okay, if we're working towards a new theory, which we can never, I mean, we can never get like an encapsulation theory of what a Hellenistic empire actually is, but I would argue that we should try to go 
also includes that theoretical direction. Um, I would argue a bit more. It's well, kind I of, think we have been yeah. going. I, I, I think yeah. I, I have a more positive take on this, but uh, I hold back because I think Stephen wants to. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was just going to say that. I, I agree with you, Nicholas, wholeheartedly, and I think you picked up on maybe some of what I've said there. And I think I'm quite conscious that I've done some knocking down or I've tried to do some knocking down and I don't like knocking things down without being able to build something up in, in their space. And the answer is I don't have anything to build up. And I, I, I've i been wrestling with it for a couple of years while I've been kind of coming to the end of writing the monograph from, from my PhD. And I've now kind of come to the place that actually I don't mind that too much. I don't mind that I don't have a paradigm that I want us to go to because, you know, I, I think I understand why you're talking about a theory of empire. I, I'd rather pluralize that and think about theories of mm -hmm. empire. And I think different, you know, I also talked about different perspectives and I think that's right. I think when you're talking about thinking about things from a Babylonian perspective and the more local kind of history, I think that's a valuable direction to go in. My one cautionary note about that is that that's something that, say, Pierre Briant has been arguing for a long time needs yes. to happen mm -hmm. in a came in studies. And one of my observations about Seleucid historiography at the moment is that a lot of the way we think about things is derived from the study of the Achaemenids and the Achaemenid workshop and Kurt and Sherwin White coming out of that mindset yeah. and one of the things I've tried to do in my monograph is to push back against the kind of continuity change framework that emerges from it and and I guess actually yeah the the, the way in which I think we might make more progress is to I think we do, we've started to do, we, if you go back to the 70s, the Hellenistic world was a whole thing. And then in the 80s and the 90s, it became the Seleucids and the Ptolemies and the Antigonids and people wrote individual monographs on those things. And then there's been something of an attempt to bring those things back together a little bit more and make them a little bit more connected, which I think is a positive step. But I think we need to do more to connect into studies of empire in other places and other periods. And I'm... It doesn't necessarily have to be hardcore comparative history. One of my interests is in what we call soft comparative history. So basically just utilizing other periods of history to raise questions and generate new research ideas. And I think we could do a little bit more of that about kind of the Seleucids, because some of the things that we talk about, you know, world systems theory or center and periphery, a lot of those ideas actually are already quite old and we're coming to them. And I just wonder if we can, not worry too much about what the big picture is and just let it emerge a little bit more organically the danger of it and this is something i think i find in the uk context is that the uk context demands the research the the ref that we're assessed against the research environment framework you need originality and significance and so you need to be almost artificially articulating everything against these kind of bigger picture ideas but I think, you know, micro history is a way forward for us in places, you know, some modern historians have done some really interesting work with that. Um, yeah, interactionism, those kinds of things. But I think, yeah, not trying to, I don't know, I don't know if that's a fair response to say, recognize yeah. that exactly what you said is a problem, but maybe not worry too much about making the jump, because if we try to worry too much about it, we force it, I guess. Yeah. No, it it just basically because I have so I'm in I've just about done the first year of my PhD and I myself am engaging both with localism, which is really popular here in Münster, and with globalization theory from like Melinda who uh Verslice and so forth. And and it's just this idea of because I'm also pretty young, I mean I've I've read a lot of his work and it, this newer came with history stuff. I also don't really agree with it. Um, but it's just kind of this this lack of a theoretical discussion, which I, I kind of miss. Um, in the sense, that I'm for me, I think kind of utilizing theory can help us look at certain of our blind spots. Because I know that when I'm working on Babylonian material, I don't have the the uh, Aramaic text, I don't have the Greek text, so by definition, I'm already missing a lot. And for me, kind of using Google globalization theory is as a way of reminding myself, okay, I should look at the other from the other perspective, from the larger perspective. I think in, in this way, this is something I often think would be, I've, I've 
find difficult to find in literature on the Slugid Empire or in general ancient historical literature or even also archaeological literature where we're talking about all these localities both in the sense of places but in the sense of sub-branches whether it's numismatics, epigraphy and so forth but and we're trying to bring them together but the how is quite loosely defined or is methodologically loose which is a good thing but on the other hand means we don't necessarily think about it enough at least that's my opinion so I could be very sympathetic and say I agree wholeheartedly, but I would be lying. I do not agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> and the, the reason is uh, uh, a lot of the things that you are asking for are already ongoing. So for years, there is a lot of, are going on with comparative studies, empire studies, also um, in the ancient world and beyond. And the Seleucids, uh, uh, the Ptolemies play a big role in it, um, especially these two empires. Um, uh, so the, the important volume um, uh, or conference turned into a volume by Zeta von Reden and uh, Christelle fischer Beauvais as one example uh, amongst many others. So my, um, um, Hans Beck is not just uh, spearheading uh, the localism uh, perspective, but mm -hmm. he's also engaged um, with many others in uh, comparing empires, including China, especially. That's uh, a very uh, established um uh, trend, I would say now in in our discipline, though I've been shunning uh, that that road because I just don't have enough lifetime to do the readings I need to say something meaningful there. So I'm sticking to various Hellenistic uh, kingdoms slash empires and the Roman sphere. But um, Ben and I, for example, we have dipped into the succession of empire theories underlying um, the narratives and the dreams, visions in Daniel which also um, opened a whole new field. The, the notion of succession of empire um, is a very broad field. Uh, uh, also, um, well, because it's transferable and uh, it's been living through the ages and the notion of empire as such is something very important that needs to come to our minds. Last but not least, I think that Richard Wenghofer and I have try to enter a new pathway with our Seleucid ideology volume by emphasizing that, well, politics, imperial politics is actually communication. And the piece that had been missing, at least in a systematic approach, was that of the acceptance part, not just the sending out of a message, but also how it is received and then how it is developed in a continuum. So this discourse, this ideological discourse, I think, um, is finding ever more attention. And it's based on the many local studies to which so many of us have been contributed. So I see arising something new that you've been asking for. But it's good that you feel vexed because that will force you to articulate something new. But Stephen, you you want? Yeah, sorry, I just I've I've got to go. Um, but I just wanted to turn it around for a second, which the the positive thing. I think sometimes we look to other fields and we say, what can we learn from them, and what can we learn from the theory, and how can we apply this theory to understand the things as though the theory is better than what we can come up with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the positive way to turn it around, and this is partly where I'm saying. I'm not too worried about what the next big paradigm is because I want us to find it. I think part of it is to say, let's, as a Saluki community, be a little bit more confident in generating our ideas and getting out and being the people that other people are looking at. Let's us come up with the theory of empire that the Romanists borrow instead of us going to them. And I think maybe that's just where I'm saying, if we're not, desperately reaching for it something will emerge we will find it we will build it and then other people can learn from us but i'm i'm really sorry because i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to shoot off now but thank you so much well, Alte, and, and to it is the time to end this but i think uh well you in particular stephen um and and nick and Rolf for contributing actively but also niklas uh, for your question which actually which seems to have hit a nerve especially uh with stephen and i wonder whether this may not be uh, the topic for another 
uh, table ronde discussion we may have in our uh, Sell You Kit group um, in uh, the upcoming ac academic year, uh, which means uh, for now we only have one session left, uh, which uh, is scheduled for Timo Claire in uh, uh, from Saarbrücken in June. It's the third uh, the third Wednesday. I I forgotten to check up the day again. Um, Timo Claire will talk about uh, Cretan Seleucid relations largely in the third century. Uh, so please join us again in June. Thank Cheers, folks. Thanks so much. Got to run. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Yeah.